Hello and welcome to Stock Talk, Self Trade's regular investment programme. In this edition, we'll be discussing stocks and shares, individual savings accounts, ISAs, and asking why they're still an underused part of investment planning. And coming up, we'll be talking to Tony Vine Lott about the benefits of these ISAs, asking the public about their own ISAs, and handing over to the wise monkeys to answer your investment questions. ISAs are tax-efficient wrappers which can hold a range of investments including UK and international shares, ETFs, corporate bonds, gilts and funds. It is striking that less than half of people in Britain who invest make use of a stocks and shares ISA. This can mean unnecessary income tax paid on dividends and potentially capital gains tax on profits. But it might also represent an oversight in the benefits of integrating an ISA into balanced portfolio planning, making investments as flexible and tax efficient as possible. ISAs can be a very effective and accessible way of saving for the long term. For instance, with retirement in mind alongside a pension. A common misconception is that the full subscription must be paid into the account and invested as a lump sum. In fact, subscriptions and investments can be made for any amount at any time within the tax year, and you can buy and sell at any point. Taking advantage of pound cost averaging, regular investment means buying at peaks and troughs, but buying disproportionately more when the market falls. We're joined by Tony Vine Lott of Tizer. Tony, why do you think that less than half of people who invest uh, make use of a self-select ISA? I think there's an issue of confidence, and indeed, unless you're actually in a situation where you can actually manage your personal investments, you have an awareness of what's happening, then perhaps people are better off having their investments supervised or managed for them in one way or another. The other part of that is lots of people, as a result, buy collectives, they have more confidence in something buying collectives, but more particularly, collectives are obviously more aggressively sold, Direct marketing from fund managers is one aspect of that, and the second one is IFAs on the whole will recommend collectives rather than a direct investment in the self-select ISA. So given that, who do you think should consider uh, opening a, an ISA or a self-select ISA? Anybody. Uh, depends on what kind of ISA you're talking about, but from the age of 16 you can take out a cash ISA, 18 obviously any kind of ISA. It's a good starting point, it's a good initial savings vehicle. So anybody can do it, but it's, um, I know it's a, any time is a good time. Where do you stand on that choice between an ISA and a, and a pension? Well it's a question I get asked very regularly and I try and encourage people to take out both. It's as simple as that. And how useful are ISAs for planning for the longer term, maybe for retirement? To me they are definitely a piece of, of retirement. I mean, obviously pensions and bonds will give you some advantage because they give you regular income and you obviously have the 25% tax-free drawdown from a pension. But in the case of ISAs, what they do is give you instant access to cash when you need it by the amount you, you require it. And you can either drip feed it out in terms of supporting your income or you can actually take lump sums should you require. It's a, it's a huge amount more flexibility in the pension. But how much money do you need to put into an ISA to make it worthwhile? Obviously, if you're starting with a cash ISA, it starts with a pound. If you're talking about stocks and shares ISAs, any amount really from £100 a month or £100 a quarter, whichever you feel comfortable with. Um, but we're talking about equities, then any stockbroker will have a different opinion on, on what is a sensible amount to a minimum amount. At one time, we would have said maybe £2,000, but because of the huge reductions in the cost of transactions now, or shares, then maybe 500 is a much more sensible figure. How else might you manage ISA investment risk? I'm a great believer in the fact that when you start off, you can afford to take higher risk because if you actually lose money, then you have a you know you have a, an opportunity if you like to replace it. But obviously, if you get to the end of your income earning capacity, then you should be moving from more aggressive earning stocks into uh, more defensive stocks, utilities, whatever. And more particularly, I find that 80% of uh, retired people actually are looking not so much for growth, but are actually looking for income. And a, a utility-based stock, whatever you want to define that as, will tend to give you that. And, and finally, where do you see ISAs in another 10 years? Uh, 10 years' time, there are two issues. One is we would like to see more flexibility in terms of uh, stocks and shares um, into cash so that people can manage their retirement, uh, ISA retirement, if you like, more effectively. And the final thing is that we're talking to government about is that there must be a holistic savings policy. 
where people have money, they put into a tax-free environment, and although there may be, may be subsets within that, such as a pension, that once you've got your money in that tax-free environment, whether it be in a bond or an ISA or a pension or whatever, that you can move the money about to a certain extent without losing tax-free status. Tony Bernard, thank you very much. Thank you. Because it's a, it's a simple product that you know everyone I think understands. It spreads the portfolio, you, the opportunity of uh, investing either with cash or with, through the stock using uh, shares uh, share I sell. Purely for the uh, tax tax breaks that yeah. I give. I have invested based on tips, but I always get the tips about three months too late. So I invest when it's too late to get the upside. I've used some of my allowances, so I've got PEPs and ISIS for example, to then tend to invest based on the track record of whoever I'm investing in. So if it's a fund, look at the track record, if you've heard the name, individual investments, I've done it based on recommendations and tips, which has always gone wrong. Look at what's cheapest, what's cheap out there. It's, it's like going into any sort of department store, looking at sales and looking what's cheap and what's good. And it's, it's just as simple as that. I suppose a, a main positive is to, is to look at companies' balance sheets, see that they're well capitalised and, and not invest in, in banks that have a lot, of, a lot of debt on their books. Welcome to the Four Wise Monkeys studios. Four Wise Monkeys filming is done for today, but Stephen and Dave have decided to stay behind and give us their views on ISAs. Welcome, gentlemen. My first question to kick off with you, Dave, mm -hmm. is when investing in an ISA, What's the best investment strategy to take and what's the best way to manage risk? I'm quite conservative about ISAs. I tend to use my ISAs much more for cautious stuff. Um, and therefore, one of the best things I think that ISAs are good for is generating an income. So if you do buy shares, then buy shares that have got um, a reasonably good dividend yield. Um, and that dividend yield pays out tax-free within your ISA and it can accumulate up over time. What is the most important thing that I should first look at when investing in an ISA for the first time? It depends on whether you're investing in an ISA for the first time or whether you're actually investing for the first time. Um, if it's the latter, then you should really make sure that you can start to build up a, a diversified portfolio. And if it's your first ever investment, then perhaps look at a collective, either a unit trust or an investment trust, even an, an ETF that might track a, an index. And, and just make sure you build up a diversified portfolio so that you, you can gradually uh, step up and step up until you, you can start investing in single shares and, and, and single equities where uh, you, you can take more of a risk. Okay, thank you very much for that. Well, that's it for this edition of Stock Talk. If you have any comments or suggestions, email me at research at selftrade.co.uk. Thank you for watching. <laughs>